We're so excited that everybody's here this morning. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I am going to do a run through and recap of all the materials that's on the table. But before I do that, I want to uh, give the mic over to somebody that doesn't need an introduction. Our wonderful Mayor Carl Dean is going to welcome everybody here today. And then I'll give you guys a lot more information when I come back. So Mayor Dean. Well, good morning and thank you. It's uh, great to be here for the third of our four neighborhood leadership training programs, and it's uh, exciting to see this level of participation on a Saturday morning. Um, I want to thank the uh, Andrews Institute for Civic Leadership uh, alumni for making this training possible. I particularly want to thank uh, Linda Pekshek, uh, who and Stacy Levine, who are here from Lipscomb, who have been instrumental in, in this and have made enormous contributions. Finally, I want to say thank you to all the Metro departments that have been uh, here and will be with you as part of this training. I hope all of you have uh, done your homework and looked into the Metro Transit Authority's end motion, the Transit Strategic Plan. I know today we'll focus on development and codes, which is a very popular topic for all of the neighborhoods on the survey and a popular topic uh, for our growing city. Uh, something I've said um, in various speeches in the past is that great cities don't um, rise or fall by chance. There's a very clear patterns to what make cities successful. Some parts of it are beyond our control, like uh, moderate climate, and hopefully we'll get a moderate climate again, <laughs> um, and, and a central location. Other parts of the equation we, we do control. And there are many factors behind Nashville's current economic success. Um, our universities, which I think is something we don't talk about enough, but it's, it's a tremendous asset in Middle Tennessee to have all these universities. And when you stop and think in TSU, Fisk, Meharry, Vanderbilt, Lipscomb, Belmont, Treveca, I'm going to leave people out, but TSU, um, all those universities are constantly attracting new people to the city. And in Middle Tennessee, uh, we have about 110,000 college graduates every year. And we keep about 60% of them, uh, which is, uh, bodes very well for our future. Uh, there's a healthcare industry. Healthcare is the number one employment sector uh, in the private sector. Uh, and in healthcare is an incredibly diverse uh, part of our economy. You have obviously the hospitals, and we are blessed to have great medical care available to us here in Nashville. But you also have uh, the fact that we're the healthcare management capital of the world. Um, and you look at that sector of the economy, and it is really one of the most entrepreneurially oriented of any that we have. Uh, one of the most interesting things to see, I think, in the city is the family tree of HCA. Uh, you see have HCA up here, and then you have about 250 companies that have spawned off that. And it, this, that just continues and continues, and that plays a huge role. And then, of course, hospitality and music, and those are very much related. Um, you know, Nashville has had a great couple of years where we almost monthly break uh, hotel occupancy uh, records, and we are attracting more and more tourists and conventioners to the city. But um, I'd be the first to admit that uh, even though we do have a beautiful convention center, they do not come here because of the beauty of the building. Uh, they come here because of music. They come here because it's located a block and a half from the honky tonks. And you know, I don't know whether it's the honky or the tonky, but there is, <laughs> there, there's something going on down there. And you, actually, the, probably the best time ever to see what's going on down there would be to drive down there tonight and you'll see a lot of blue, um, and, and they are, they're everywhere, and those places are just knocking it out. And you're another half a block up, and there's the Ryman, you have the Frist, you have the Skirmerhorn, you have the amphitheater that'll open this summer. Uh, people come to Nashville because we have a unique cultural uh, gift, which is music, and they want to be part of it. Uh, and so those, those are great, diverse foundations for our city's economy. It's a recipe for success that has uh, caught the attention of national news outlets, and, and uh, we received uh, lots of attention from city planning and certainly our competitor cities. But it's something we can't take for granted. Our growth is, uh, in, is what fuels our ability to fund our city's basic needs. Uh, many of you wrote in your online survey about the very growth in your own neighborhoods. Uh, nearly half of our city's $1.9 billion budget 
is funded by property tax revenues. It's our largest source uh, for city revenue, and it's our largest source for revenue growth over the years. That's not because taxes are increasing. Um, you know, as I look back on eight years, I can say that we've had one um, revenue enhancement since I've been mayor. Uh, but the property tax rate now is actually lower than when I took office because of, re uh, because of reassessment of property. It's actually lower than when I took office. And of the four major cities in Tennessee, we have the lowest tax rate. And that's because uh, a couple things. I think, number one, having the metropolitan form of government has been a huge asset in terms of running an efficient uh, city. But it's also because our city is growing. So whether you care about sidewalks, schools, or park space, uh, or another fundamental services that our city provides, the growth and development that occurs in the city is providing the tax base to make sure that certain services are, are possible and certain uh, improvements are possible. In July of 2014, we cut the ribbon on the Development Service Center across the way here on the first floor of, this, of uh, the Metro Office Building. And the goal of that center is to help make new construction and development in our city uh, easier, not just for contractors and developers who do that work every day, but also for homeowners and small business owners who play a major role in our city's growth. Um, you know, one of the things that I think uh, I'm proudest of in the last uh, few years, Nashville, when I, back when we, in 07, people talked about how unfriendly the development process was in Nashville. Um, and then uh, we were looking poorly compared to some of our com the counties around us. I think now, if word of mouth would be that we do better than they do. We do it more efficiently, we do it faster, we don't put up, we don't put up a lot of hinder, hindrances. We enforce the laws, we, we enforce what we have on the books, but we don't make them people jump through bureaucratic hoops unnecessarily, and we bring all the relevant parties together very quickly. And I think as a city, we need to be smart about how we grow. We have to plan for how we grow. Uh, but the bottom line is that um, to continue to succeed, we, we, have, to, we have to have growth. And, and you know, the speed of that growth can be d discussed and debated, but a city has to grow. There's a great line by Bob Dylan who said, uh, you know, if you're not busy being born, you're busy dying. And this city's strength comes from the fact that uh, we attract new people, we attract diverse people, and we're a city that's constantly being reinvented, and that's a strength. And that's something, we're, we're a city that's being born, and that's, that's a good thing. The Development Service Center, is, in, is, I think, is very innovative, and I want to take just a moment to acknowledge that. Uh, government at any level is not often known for thinking outside the box. Government departments often function in silos, and that was certainly the case with Metro's land use agencies just uh, up to nine months ago. Now we can celebrate that we've broken down those barriers in the construction permitting process to create a one-stop shop and make our government better serve the public. That work has paid off. The city has set an all-time record in calendar year 2014 with $2.275 billion in building construction. Um, and that, that, that is good news. We have also uh, worked to stay focused on bolstering small business in Nashville. Last year, we introduced a small business incentive, businesses with, a, with fewer than 100 employees that add 10 or more full-time workers in Davidson County at an annual wage rate greater than 80% of the average for the Nashville MSA are now eligible for a grant of $500 per job added or $750 per veteran hired. This is important to continue the small business uh, uh, growth in our, in our economy. Not only do we need to continue to bolster and help small businesses, but we also need to continue development so we can continue creating more and better jobs. Uh, the Mayor's Office of Economic and Community Development works in partnership with the National Area Chamber of Commerce and the Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development to recruit new and expanding businesses to Nashville. Uh, we have seen um, Nashville do very well coming out of the recession. Our unemployment rate is, compared to most cities in the country, is, is lower, um, and it's, it's much lower than the rest of the state. More than 350 companies have expanded or uh, located here since uh, 2007. With all of this news related to growth, we need to continue to plan for our future. By 2035, Middle Tennessee region is projected to grow by a million people. All right, so just to get your heads around that, the way 
I think of it is, if this region grows by a million people between now and 2035, and I think those are relatively conservative projections about the potential growth here, that this region will be the same size of what the Denver region is now. So if you've been to Denver, you know what that, what, what the size of that, you can picture that's what the Middle Tennessee will, will be. How we welcome these new Tennesseans, how we stay competitive with other regions in the country, and how we honor our culture while embracing new cultures, and how we protect the quality of life, these are all issues that we must address with innovative and cooperative strategies at the local and the regional level. The Nashville Next process is creating Nashville's 30-year plan, and it has continued to engage more than 17,000 voices in the process. And it's important that uh, you stay involved through the final stages. You can go to uh, nashvillenext.net to learn more about the topics discussed in, the, in Nashville Next and to add your own ideas to the uh, conversation. Today, I hope you walk away from this training with more information about your neighborhood story, and I hope you will be able to connect with other with metro departments and uh, metro employees to learn about what they do. And I hope to see you all at the final training, which is on March 28th at the Martha O'Brien Center at 9 a.m., and flyers for that session should be on the table. Together, I think we can keep Nashville moving in the right direction. And as I always say, I really do believe, bottom of my heart, that Nashville's best days are still to come. This is going to be a better city 10, 15, 20 years from now. But it's important to stay focused on the fundamentals and how we got here and then build on that. So have a great day, and thanks for being here. All right, thank you, Mayor Dean. Uh, I'm gonna get this back up. Um, and while that's turning back on, uh, I'm actually gonna need our friend Bill to come do the password for me, because <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> Uh, and in the process, I just wanted to take a second to do a few introductions. Uh, I know a lot of you folks. Uh, some of you I know better than others. I'm Courtney Wheeler. I'm in the Office of Neighborhoods in the Mayor's Office. And we also have Erin Williams here who has stepped out. And I thought she might do that right at the time I was going to introduce her. But she was the one sitting up at the front when you guys walked in. We are the Office of Neighborhoods. And our role in the office is to connect you all to Metro Service and be a liaison and support for neighborhoods across the county. So that's our role, and there she is. There's Erin. Hi, Erin. <laughs> I thought that might happen. <laughs> Um, so our role in the office is really to help neighborhoods and in any way that would improve the quality of life for each neighbor. And so we're there to connect you to government services. We're there to help you just have conversations about issues in your neighborhoods. We're there to help you in some instances start your neighborhood association. We're there to connect you to other resources. So anything that you all need, we just wanted to remind you guys that we're there for you and please call us. Uh, our information cards you can gather at the end of this or obviously through this training session, um, there'll be, um, there was a lot of information that was shared through that. Um, and I see here that our PowerPoint still is not quite on because we're locked out. So I'm gonna continue on and continue on a recap without my slides. So uh, how many of you guys participated in a survey that was sent out in November 2013 or 2014? So I see a few hands that went up. That was the survey that the mayor was actually referencing in his talk. That survey asked all of you all about your priorities as a neighborhood, asked you guys about your interconnectedness to Metro, asked you guys about your interconnectedness to each other. And we learned a lot from that survey. We learned about your priorities in your neighborhood, which was, you know, we thought it would be sidewalks. It ended up being public safety, number one. And that, that by an alarming rate, actually, and I was gonna show you those stats right here, but uh, we'll show you that in just a second. Um, yeah, he's got to go get it. Um, so by, by an alarming rate, it was crime and safety. Number four was actually sidewalks. And number three on that list was things like growth, infill, and planning, which is why this training, the third session, is going to highlight our codes and planning department at the, at the latter part of the session. 
so that's that's a little bit background about why you guys are here, what we're doing, and how this curriculum was set. On your tables, you guys have uh, an agenda that we'll walk through that I would show you also on the PowerPoint, but it's on your table, and it'll show you what we're going to do today. Um, it'll also, there's also some materials that Stacy is going to reference in her presentation that's also in that packet. So please, everybody, take a packet. And then that last sheet is something that Aaron put together for everybody, which is just a reminder about departmental contact information. So direct numbers to the departments. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> that is just great. Uh, so uh, I just went through the agenda. So we'll have, um, like I said, that's the top, the top sheet on your packet. Before I move on any further, I want to introduce Linda and Stacy. The mayor did introduce them already, but Linda is the founding director at the Andrews Institute for Civic Leadership, and she actually came to us with the idea of taking the leadership, collaborative leadership techniques that they use at the Andrews Institute to the neighborhoods. And we got very excited about that because uh, we thought it would be a great opportunity to bring neighbors together. We thought this would uh, create a platform to also connect you all the metro governments, but then also to learn a really valuable skill set. And so we're very excited that Linda's here. She's also had uh, the alumni from the Andrews Institute teach each one of these different sessions. So we're very lucky to have Stacey Levine here uh, with her. She will talk to you guys about the storytelling piece and how she's done some pretty amazing things um, after she's done the community asset portion and then turning it into a story. So we're really excited about that piece as well. So that's, that, that's our partner on this. Um, at the Andrews Institute. So we talked a little bit about the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods. The other person that's in the Mayor's Office that's actually not here with us right now is a gentleman named Daniel Drumright. Um, so you will either get myself, Aaron, or Daniel if you call our office. Um, one of the other things I wanted to make sure to remind you of, we talked about this in the first session. Uh, one of the things that's coming out of this training, in addition to connecting each other, is we had some seasoned neighborhood leaders raise their hand and say they would offer to be neighborhood coaches. Uh, the neighborhood coaches do everything from, you know, ways that they have built, like what Hip Donaldson did with the farmer's market, um, sort of in, in branding and identifying their neighborhood as a, in a specific way. Uh, we have two of our neighborhood coaches here. If I miss anybody, raise your, uh, we have three of them, I believe. We have Pauline Gilson over from Hermitage. She is here to help on any kind of infrastructure or issues of that nature. We have David Morales from Woodbine, who also is um, here to talk a little bit about welcoming new neighbors uh, and you know connecting them with old neighbors, which is something Woodbine has faced a lot of. And then we also have, uh, I think we have Lindsay, Yes, I thought I saw you. Lindsay from Salem Town, and she does a lot of work in the online world on Nextdoor, Twitter, Facebook, and connecting those worlds. So she's very seasoned in that. And I think those are the only coaches we have here today. But we have them on a, a lot of different topics. If you are interested at all in connecting with a neighborhood coach, uh, just email us at mayorantnashville.gov, and we're happy to connect you with one of the coaches. Um, uh, this is a little bit about the survey results. Like I said, there was about 540 responses on this, uh, 130 different neighborhood associations. And this portion, this is just an example, but talked about the connectedness to uh, Metro government. And we learned that while people feel connected, we still have a lot of work to do. And so that's another reason why we launched these, uh, these surveys. So this was that information that I was telling you about in the survey. Um, crime and safety, 28%. And this was an open-ended question. This was an open-ended question in neighborhoods that basically asked you all, uh, what is your priority in the neighborhood? And from that open-ended question, we had 154 different people say crime and safety is number one, which I thought was very interesting. And then we had the traffic, uh, which came in at 12%, zoning infill at 11%, and then sidewalks came in at 11%, which I also thought was interesting because everybody, I think, attaches neighborhoods to sidewalks when really neighborhoods are about a lot of things. They're about everything that touches basically your doorstep. 
And so this was just a reminder of that. So again, all of these surveys are online. All of the materials from this program is going to be posted online. It'll be up there as a resource from this point forward. Uh, the, anything that you need or want or questions about this, you can email us at mayoratnashville.gov. And we had a little change than what the mayor said on the location of the fourth session. That actually happened yesterday. Uh, so we are actually now meeting at East Park for the final session of the leadership training. It'll be a big recap session. Uh, we're really excited about this one. It'll be March 28th at East Park Community Center, 600 Woodland Street. Those flyers are actually out on the table as well. Um, so just wanted to clarify the location there. And now I'm going to turn this over to our friends at Lipscomb, and they'll take it from here for the next hour or so. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, it's so good to see this many people out again on a Saturday morning, and I understand we have about 50% uh, new folks who haven't been at session one and two, and so I'm going to do a quick recap. Uh, as the mayor and Courtney said, I'm Linda Peekshack. I'm the founding director of the Andrews Institute for Civic Leadership at Lipscomb, and I have a passion about developing collaborative leaders who can bring about the change that they envision for their community, whether it's at the neighborhood level, Level, the city level, the state level, uh, and sometimes even the national level. But it all starts at home, and it all starts with those people who are closest to the ground, and those are you, the leaders in our neighborhoods. The mayor talked about constant reinvention. And he talked about doing that, being intentional about it, and using the assets that you have at your disposal. And what he didn't mention, uh, but alluded to, is there are challenges sometimes in moving forward to the vision you have for your neighborhood. And so we're here to help you kind of figure out what are the assets that you have in your neighborhood that can help you develop a vision and then organize around it. The one thing that is constant is change. And so the word reinvention is probably a good one. Even though you may say, well, I like my neighborhood the way it is. Part of what we want to do is keep it this way. That's good. You know then how to put together a vision that will keep the things that you want to keep sacred within your neighborhood. If I go back to the first session, for those of you who are with us, I'll just quickly say that we focused on uh, a set of assessments to be a collaborative leader that were developed for the healthcare industry over the course of 10 years. Those are posted online. The piece we're going to work on today and that we have been focused on off and on through the sessions is the one that says you must have clarity of vision in order to mobilize. Clarity of vision in order to mobilize. We talked a little bit in the first session about what a good vision is. And a good vision is a concrete picture of the future. A concrete picture of the future. What will your neighborhood look like if you are successful? I don't see Jeff Sexton here, but we were working with him, and what we came up with him was that he wanted uh, to work with his neighborhood to create a safe, walkable neighborhood. And it can be something as simple as that. A vision should be understandable, but it should also be inspiring, and it should be achievable. People should see, yes, we can achieve this vision, but it should be aspirational. It's a stretch. So we can achieve it, we got to work together and stretch to get there, and then use inspirational language. And part of that is just drawing a really vibrant view of what your neighborhood can be. So we worked on vision, and you're going to work on yours again today, too. Uh, that's why there's paper at each of the tables. Uh, and then we also looked at, then, how do you map assets? And also posted online is the asset mapping tool that we gave you. We're going to talk more about that today and actually drill a little deeper to make sure that you're uncovering all the assets in your community that you can use, whether it's natural beauty or architecture or business or entertainment, cultural uh, assets. We want to make sure you've uncovered all of those and you know how to use them to put together a vision of the future. So today, you're going to do most of the work. 
That's, uh, and I think, do we have pages at every table? Good, okay. Um, if you're at a table that has only a few people, you may want to move to a table that has more. The bad news on this is that I'm going to ask you to choose one neighborhood to focus on. Uh, and then the rest of you can keep notes and develop ideas for your neighborhood. But the neighborhood you're going to report on, on the big sheets, I need you to choose one. Um, if there are several from one neighborhood and you want to move around to a table so you're all together, that's fine. Otherwise, if you can choose one neighborhood you're going to work on uh, in the next that's represented by somebody at your table. Um, and if you just really, really, really don't, um, if, you, if you're at a table that chooses a neighborhood other than yours and you really do re want to report on yours, we'll let you do that too. But for this exercise, let's choose one. Um, this is for, and I understand Edge Hill is ready to report, is that right, from the earlier, from the earlier work you've done? Where's Edge Hill? Oh, okay, maybe they're not, uh, never mind. I guess the people who said they wanted to report are not here yet, so when they get here, we'll let them do that. So the very first thing I want you to do at your tables, number one, choose a neighborhood. And second, quickly after a brief conversation, and this is not perfect, but it's the first things that come to mind to develop a vision for that neighborhood. What is the vision for the neighborhood you've chosen? It's one line. It's like, as I said, with Jeff Sexton, it was a safe, walkable neighborhood. I worked with the nations. Anybody here from the nations? Yeah, I worked from the, with uh, one of your colleagues from the nations, and several things came up there that could be included as we looked at asset planning. But the idea that you're the birthplace of Nashville uh, was one thing that came up. So you want, but what else do you want as a vision for, for your neighborhood? Okay. One way to get at this is to think about what the challenges are. What are the challenges that you want to meet? So if you want a safer neighborhood, then part of your vision is a safe neighborhood. Or a safe neighborhood tapping into what? Into the culture, the architecture, the people that you have there. So there's no right way to do this, and what we're going to do is work on a couple to show you how you can develop that and get people to follow you on that vision. The next thing we're going to do is asset mapping. So let's quickly do the vision. And Stacy and I will be coming around the tables to help you. Okay, everybody, I'm going to walk out here, see if I can get everybody's attention. Um, here's what I'm hearing as I walk around the tables. You need to recognize that you are stronger together. The smaller the unit, the harder it is it's going to be for you to bring about the change you want. You are stronger together. So if you are part of a part of town that has several different neighborhoods who are trying to achieve the same thing, then you should work together with them. The same goes for as we talked about last time and in the first session, the different types of human resources, the different types of neighbors that you have, the people who've been there forever, the people who are moving in, the people who have chosen your neighborhood to move into, and the people who've lived there for 40 years. Those are all people that you need to engage as neighborhood leaders, not just one group of them, because you're not gonna be able to advance a vision 
for your neighborhood if you don't have all or at least a good number of your neighbors on board. So please think about that as you're thinking about what you want to do with your neighborhood, how you want to improve it, how you want to attract either businesses or entertainment or cultural events or not into your neighborhood. But remember, you're stronger together. Okay, I'm gonna give you about four more minutes to finish your vision, and then we're gonna talk about how to do the asset mapping that about 50% of you, I think, have already done. Is anybody really, really, really wanting to share their vision before we go to asset mapping around your vision? Yes, okay, Green Hills will share their vision. Okay, we, we have a threefold uh, continuously edited vision um, of, um, and the first thing would be to elevate the conversation and communicate with people better so they understand sort of what the existing zoning laws are and, are and what the methods are to impact them. Secondly, to encourage, okay. Secondly, to encourage safe movement within the neighborhoods, which would include sidewalks and um, bike lanes, that sort of thing. To, to connect from Forest Hills all the way to Hillsborough Village. And then the third thing is to continue Carl's theme of public asset utilization. So you would aggregate, we sort of have the library and Hillsborough High School and the post office all right there and put government services there so you could take one, you could drive your automobile, ride your bike or walk to one place and renew driver's licenses, get tags for things. Um, and have community meetings there so that the public spaces really are that. That's our vision. <laughs> okay, here's what I heard. An inclusive, connected neighborhood with a central meeting place for government services and community engagement. Okay, so do you see how a vision begins to help you determine what assets you need. So very good job of putting down everything you wanted to do, you know, the th you identified the challenges, and then, pulled, and then pulling out of that inclusive, connected neighborhood with a central meeting place for government services and community engagement. Does that, you begin to see how that comes together? Okay, so let's go now to asset mapping, unless anybody else wants to share their vision. Yes, okay, this table wants to, and another one over here, okay. We do have to get to storytelling today, so yes. So, so oh, oh. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Marianne Howland, and I'm from the Music Row, the brand new Music Row Neighborhood Association. And um, so we have a, we have a unique um, challenge with, we're just coming together and just trying to establish who are we and what is, what is our vision. So one of our unique challenges, as you know, is, is in our neighborhood, we have some 400 plus residential uh, folks and then we have about 300 commercial property owners. So we have a very integrated um, community, and then we have the music industry, which is very strong, and is a we view it as an asset to the city. It's a unique asset to the city. So, what is the proper balance? And all that development that's happening really, really, really fast, as you know, 
music row, it's been stopped, halted for a moment while we try to figure out what do we want? What do we, how do we um, manage our growth in a way that's healthy for our community? So <clears throat> the, the, this table of wonderful people who have been very supportive in helping us try to think this through, we came up with an integrated music row neighborhood association, an integrated development while celebrating and preserving our culture would be key to informing what our process for moving forward with our neighborhood association. So that's my. <laughs> yes. Excuse me. Um, from I-40 down to Wedgwood, um, about 21st over to 17th. Thanks. I've, I've been following, and so is Stacy, the Music Row development with great interest. Um, and, and it's an occupational hazard that when I hear you talking, uh, some of you know, if you've looked at my bio, that I worked for Coca-Cola for 12 years as their vice president for global communications and strategy. So I immediately think brand, right? And we're going to talk about brand in a minute. But I... For Music Row, I love your vision. I also think once you decide what you want to attract there and, what you, and how you want to preserve it, that part of what you want to sell is to come live and work and play where Music City was born or where the music was born. Um, but that's, you know, so let's play off that asset we have that Mayor Dean talked about, um, that we're known as Music City. And you know, it was only about 12, 13 years ago that everybody in the city embraced that. Um, so I think it's really important to, to use it, and I love your vision as well. Okay, anybody else? Yes, okay. So. <laughs> okay, so um, we just so happen to sit next to each other. We are the Madison community, and um, I guess one of the big challenges, you know, that we face right now is um, the congestion on Gallatin Road. Gallatin Road is a main thoroughfare. We've got a, a major bus line that goes through there. Um, there's been lots of pedestrians that have been hit walking, crossing the street. Um, we've got an accessibility issue with people that are in wheelchairs that are, are handicapped. Just, you know, getting getting around town, getting to the stores, getting to the libraries, getting to, you know, places they, they need to go to. So um, that's one of our challenges. And so um, we were talking here, and our vision for the Madison community is a place that has safe, walkable neighborhoods, access to community center programs and parks, and a revitalized economic center that will attract businesses and industries. And so that's what we're working on. Very good. Do you see how refining this helps you see what the next steps are, right? So the next step, is there anybody else who wants to share a vision before, I, okay. This is the last, oh, one there too? All right, I, oh, and here, okay, let's all share. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll try to make mine quick. Uh, my name is Mike Norris. Uh, I am from uh, Creekside of Brentwood. It's a uh, gated community uh, at the intersection of Old Hickory and Edmondson Pike. We're on the hill up behind the Kroger store, uh, about 154 uh, townhouse units. And uh, my vision for our neighborhood is a modern, forward-looking neighborhood with shopping and restaurants within walking distance, with a park and a greenway within the boundaries of the community. Uh, we've got uh, three grocery stores within walking distance and several restaurants there at Nippers Corner. Uh, our community... Uh, Common land includes a transmission right-of-way that is the extension of a greenway that exists up at the Ellington Agricultural Center. There's a place there, Whitman Park, I believe it's called. There's baseball fields. There's a parking lot, and then there's access to a greenway that runs under, uh, adjacent to the TVA transmission line there. And our, my vision would uh, like to see an extension of that greenway come into our neighborhood underneath that same transmission right-of-way with a park, some extra parking that we desperately needed for our community. Uh, Forward-looking, 
I'm a retired electrical engineer, and so one of the things I uh, in, would like to investigate is uh, all in that same transmission highway, I'd like to see us investigate building a solar farm that could serve the whole neighborhood. Our neighborhood could be literally off the grid. Great. Now, what Mike just did was give you not only a vision, and we'll applaud him in a minute, gave you not only a vision, but the next two things we're going to do. He talked about the assets in his community, and then he talked about what he needs to do to activate those assets and to use them to realize his vision. So we're going to do those two things very quickly before we go to storytelling, but we have two more visions. Let's give Mike a round of applause while I figure out who's next. Good morning. I'm Kathy Hunt. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Kathy Hunt, and um, we were all from different neighborhoods, so it sounded like mine needed the most help, so we chose my area. <laughs> and my area is uh, Parkwood area, Brick Church Pike. Anybody familiar with that? It's right off of Trinity Lane. It runs over to Old Hickory Boulevard. Uh, White's Creek is on one side, and Dickerson Road is the other. And if you're familiar with that area, you know that it really lacks a lot, a lot of resources. And there is a public safety issue. So our statement, I say that loosely, is um, a safe neighborhood with access to basic necessities, such as sidewalks and shopping, places for learning, such as libraries, public playgrounds, places to eat, and entertainment. All right, I'm we're. Not gonna, I'm not going to comment. I'm just going to say very good, and, and that was terrific. And we'll work on it in the next iteration when you do your essay map. Yes. Hi, I'm she. <laughs> I'm Shan Canfield, and I'm secretary of our newly established East Hill Neighborhood Association. And I've got several people here from other neighborhood associations from East Nashville, and then we go over here to Hillwood and such. But I'm doing our neighborhood, East Hill, which has a lot of the same vision that the rest of our nearby neighbors have. And that is to create an engaged, connected, and cleaner neighborhood with safe walkable streets. Not only safe walkable streets, but safe passage on public transportation. People want to feel safe when they get on metro buses. Uh, we also want consistent and quality education within our neighborhood schools. So that's... Very good. Yeah. Anybody else before we go to asset mapping and stories? Yes, hand up back there, Bordeaux. One more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, our groups, pretty much got uh, several folks from different neighborhoods, but the neighborhood we chose uh, was Bordeaux, uh, and the Clarksville Highway area there. So uh, just the short. Oh, all right, there we go. Short and sweet. Uh, we wanted to encourage and control growth to revitalize and unify the Clarksville Highway Corridor. Very clean, clean, direct, easy to figure out what to do next, right? And do you see how all of you had different challenges you were facing that you, sorry, you've all had different challenges you were facing in order to create that vision. And that's good. It's good for a lot of reasons. One is you're not all going to be going to the same metro department <laughs> at the same time uh, to do some things, although I think sidewalks is a big deal here, so um, as we saw in the survey. Uh, but the other is that you can be really creative in a space that maybe other people are not playing in as you, as you think about the differences in your visions. Okay, another way to make sure that you are playing in a space that is unique to you is to do some asset mapping. Now, I already mentioned that Mike had done that. Now, I have to say something. Mike had a jump on all of you because he stayed afterwards at the second session and we worked on asset mapping with him. So now, what do I mean by assets? Well, if you take the, one of the sheets that uh, is at the table that has people and resources and... 
So resources in terms of, you know who your people are, but you need to identify if there are different segments, if there are different types of neighbors that you need to identify that you want to make sure in, you include. And then under resources, there's all sorts of things. There's historical resources like Music Row has. There's cultural resources like Music Row has. Um, there are natural resources, not sure Music Row has that, but, um, but natural resources like what Mike was talking about, like the Greenways. There are cultural resources um, that may be that you have a theater based in your neighborhood. Um, it may be one of our many, many uh, nonprofit theaters here in Nashville that you want to consider that that's part of your, res those are your resources as well. What did I leave out? An so event. Event resources, if you do a farmer's market, uh, if you, let's see, where's Salem Town? Don't you have an October Halloween Fest? Yeah. Yes, Halloween block party. Uh, does that have anything to do with Salem uh, and, and the witch trials? No, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so, so those are the types of cultural, historical, architectural uh, uh, resources that you have within your neighborhood. Now you may say, you know what, like, uh, and I'm going to go back to Salem Town, you may have, when you start putting down your human resources, somebody who's really good at online media, at digital media, uh, just as Salem Town has, and so you want to make sure you include that in your human resources. You may have um, nutritionists, dietitians, and gardeners who are in your neighborhood who could help you with a farmer's market or with some nutrition training for the people in your neighborhood. It's interesting to me that almost none of you put healthy in your vision. And since it is kind of a unfortunate fact that Tennessee and Nashville are among the most obese uh, cities and states in the country, Country. Um, I think you want to always think about, now walkable helps with the exercise part of that, but always think about how do you have a healthy neighborhood as well. I'm getting some nods and some smiles, so I, I hope, uh, hope some of you will think about including that. Um, okay, so let's take about... I'm sorry. So let's take about four minutes, and you can do this either individually or as a table around the neighborhood you've chosen. But write down for either one neighborhood at a table or all your neighborhoods. Take that form and just quickly, and remember, this is, this is quick and dirty, right? And you're going to go home and play with it. But quick and dirty, the people, the neighbors, the human resources, and all of the other resources, assets that you have in your neighborhood. Okay, I'm really excited that you are into the asset mapping discussion. This is part of your homework for the last session because you, of course, will want to go back and talk with the people in your neighborhoods about what they think the assets are as well. One of the aspects of collaborative leadership that we discussed was that your vision and your strategy should be developed with the people who have to help you get there, right? And so when you go back, ask your neighbors what assets they think your neighborhood has, what they think your neighborhood is lacking, and make sure you're including that in your vision as well. So your homework for next time, this is piece number one of the homework, is to finish the asset mapping exercise and to refine your vision as you do that asset mapping. I don't think Mike would have come up with the vision he did if he hadn't also gone back and revised it after he did his asset mapping. 
So you want to see what do you have, what do you need, and how do you build that into a vision? Yes, ma'am. Will you be able to put us in touch with the people who are already active in our community? You know there's a name for Aaron. Aaron will make sure that you are connected with other active and inactive groups in your uh, in your area okay because i'm thank you for asking that because it shows that you are recognizing you're stronger together that's great okay the next piece of homework is going to be to bring to the next session a couple of stories that will support your argument for change. A couple of stories that reflect the essence of your neighborhood. And I am so happy to present to you Stacy Levine, one of the um, uh, Masters in Civic Leadership graduates, as of this May, uh, who is an architect and a storyteller and someone who both in her work with us uh, at the Institute, where we do case studies of what has worked and not worked in Nashville, uh, it, she has, in her case study, looked at three different neighborhoods, and she'll give you an idea of how she researched and found the types of symbols and photographs and stories that she needed. And then she chose, as her master's project, to begin to create walking tours for communities. And she started with Dixon, her hometown, and she's going to tell you the process that she used, again, to identify identify how do we capture the essence of our neighborhood through stories. Thank you, Linda. Um, yes, my name is Stacy Levine, and I live in Rosebank in East Nashville now, but I grew up in Dixon. And Linda invited me today because um, some of the things we worked on in the program at Lipscomb, as well as my thesis project, work with storytelling and neighborhoods. And so I'm here today just to share a little bit of what I've done with that and share some ideas with you all um, through that. Now, I'm going to start with showing you a case study that myself and two other of my um, of my cohort worked on. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'll show you how to get to it online if you want to go check it out. It's a case study that looks on urban redevelopment in, in downtown Nashville, and we looked at uh, Rolling Mill Hill, the Gulch, and um, the new ballpark going in over in um, North Nashville. So um, if you want to take a look at it, um, you can go to lipscomb.edu backslash civic leadership and then you would, you would click on graduate programs, and then you would look down here at Nashville case studies. And there are quite a few that you can um, peruse, but the one that I worked on was urban redevelopment in Nashville. And if, um, if any of you are from these three neighborhoods, this is a great resource to access because we have, for Rolling Mill Hill, the Gulch, in the Capital District, we have history. We did uh, a lot of just research, you know, using the libraries and um, typical research methods. We have the history of Jefferson Street, where we worked with um, the Neighborhood Association and JUMP, the Jefferson United Merchants uh, Partnership. Um, and so then we also researched the history of Sulphur Dell, and we um, we found, you know, out who's who's building the new ballpark, um, who in the government um, is a key player in getting the ballpark in that neighborhood, and we, we interviewed all those people. You can get to key players, and you can see some of our interviews somewhere. Um, anyway, so this is a very comprehensive case study uh, looking at these three neighborhoods and how urban redevelopment looked in those three neighborhoods. So that's a good good place to start if any of you want to just look at um, that as a case study, but also if, if those are any of your neighborhoods um, to get started. And you can also look over on Lessons Learned, and we have um, all of our videos. And this, If you go to lipscomb.edu backslash civic leadership, there are lots of case studies on um, on that page, but if you go to graduate studies, and then click on Nashville case studies. You can see um, about eight different, eight or nine different case studies. But the one I worked on is urban it was redevelopment. urban redevelopment in Nashville. If I could also say that Stacy did an interview on this one. Uh, I don't know where you can find it. The interview. See, there we go. Um, the 
uh, the interview you did with Steve Tuck. Okay. She did an interview with the architect Steve Tuck, uh, the architect Manuel Zeitlin, and with Erica Gilmore. Erica Gilmore about what makes a good neighborhood. And so you have two architects who've been involved in different developments in different neighborhoods. And you have Erica, in particular, talking about the development of the Capital District as the baseball park comes into play. So it's really worth watching. It's 30 minutes long. The front end of it really does begin to talk about what a good neighborhood is. Okay. okay. So that's just um, to show you how you can access that. Um, and next I'm going to tell you just about what I'm doing with my thesis project at Lipscomb because, like I said, it works with neighborhoods and storytelling. Um, as Linda mentioned, I'm an architect and um, I'm really passionate about buildings. But beyond just the physical buildings, I'm really passionate about the stories that buildings can tell. Um, and so, like many of you, it alarms me that so much redevelopment is happening so quickly. I don't think all of it's a bad thing because I am an architect. But um, I just wanted to find a a way to preserve the stories behind the buildings so that people maybe um, could realize maybe um, some of the history and beauty on their block that maybe they've walked past every day and not thought twi twice about. And so um, I really just, um, this was a way to kind of educate the public and help instill a sense of pride in, in their physical assets that are, that are present already in their neighborhood. So, um, I'm developing a, a walking tour in my hometown of Dixon um, that works with storytelling. And when I tell people I'm developing an architectural walking tour for Dixon, a lot of people kind of look at me funny because Dixon does not have um, the amazing historical architecture like much of Nashville and Franklin has. But it is my firm belief that every neighborhood and town um, has a story to tell, a unique story to tell. And that's really what I'm working with. And so the way my project works and I'm just here to show you because this is an example and feel free to um, I'm going to sh share with you how I'm doing all of it because I'm not um, a web developer or an app developer or tech savvy really at all um, but um, the way it works is I've identified um, nine different buildings in down di downtown Dixon that I would like to be on the tour, and I've done all the um, historical research behind the buildings. I have um, history, I have historic photos, and then my final step is I'm interviewing community members. I'm, I'm through my asset mapping, I've figured out who I need to speak to to get these stories behind the buildings. Who grew up. Um, in the back room of this building because their parents owned the business and they grew up running up and down Main Street. You know, who who had the shop on the corner all these years and who remembers Dixon when it was a vibrant, thriving downtown? <laughs> um, so um, I've worked over the last six months to identify those, those community assets and right now I'm conducting the interviews. And so the way the tour works is it works with QR codes. And so I have a little sticker on each of the buildings and um, when you blip the QR code with your smartphone, all of the information pops up, the history, the photos, and uh, a way to access the audio file to listen to the interviews. So is the purpose of doing this to um, have to uh, enlighten people so that they will appreciate their neighborhood more? Be I mean, what's the purpose of it? So my vision <laughs> for this, yes, was to um, instill a sense of pride in, in locals who maybe didn't realize that Dixon has a kind of actually cool history. Um, but also, we have an amazing asset in Dixon, which is a museum, the Clement Railroad Hotel Museum. And we actually have a lot of tourists that come to Dixon to visit the museum. And so this is a way to engage the tourists beyond the museum, to get them down Main Street and spending money. And you know, so my hope is that this also drives some economy. Um, but really, yeah, it's just to open locals' eyes and tourists as well to, to a quintessential Southern Railroad town, as I like to to call Dixon. So this is how it works. This is my website, dashtour.org, if you want to um, go check it out. Um, and if you click on the About button, you can see all of the buildings that I have done research on so far. And my hope is to grow it and to um, include every building in downtown and to grow it to the entire county and eventually the entire state. <laughs> so um, so this is just an example of one of the, the buildings. I have the history, the photos, and then down here you can click to listen to the audio of the interviews I've, con I've conducted. And um, one important thing when you are um, identifying your, your person assets, so, you know, these people 
people that you want to get the stories from is you want to kind of know what questions you're going to ask because you can't just ask the same questions. If you have an architect, you might want to ask them, why did you design the building this way? You know, what what did the client want? What did you want to do? How you know what did the developer do? You know, did the developer push you any way that you wouldn't have gone? Um, you know, why is this building this way? If you have a longtime business owner, you may want to ask, you know, how has the business environment changed since you've been here? Um, what do you see uh, for the future, you know, in retail and business? So just kind of come up with, with different questions um, for the different people that you're identifying as your assets. Um, so um, this is one way that I've chosen to tell my neighborhood story. So now we're going to work on finding a way to tell your neighborhood story. Um, if you are interested in doing a website or audio um, interviews or any of that type of thing, um, like I said, I'm not tech savvy, and I've done this all myself. Um, and I can share with you a few of the resources I've used. Um, for example, I have, I've used a free um, website platform called Wix.com, W-I-X.com. So if any of you want to start a website for your neighborhood, that is a great and free way to, user-friendly way to set up a website if you're not, if you don't have resources to help you do that. Um, with my interviewing, I've just used my, my cell phone, um, the voice recording device on my cell phone to, to conduct the interviews. And then I've used a free um, audio editing program called Audacity. So that's a way, if you if you choose to do audio interviews, to, to record and then edit um, your interviews. So um, I think we're going to. Now that you've thought about your assets and your brand, you know, think about what is the story you want to tell and how you can tell it. Um, what person, what kind of person do you need to go talk to? Do you need to start with the the neighborhood association and then ask from there? You know, if you don't know who to get to or how to get to that person, um, how do you get to those people? Um, and then, how can you find authentic people to reinforce the brand, the vision that um, you've set for yourself and your neighborhood? Um, is there anything else, Linda? That <laughs> well, I think it's important to go back to what we were talking about earlier, and that is you want to make sure you include, as you go around and collect your stories about your neighborhood, all of the neighbors. You want to make sure that you go to the people who've lived there for a long time and get their stories. You want to make sure that you go to the people who've just moved in and ask them, why, are they, why did they choose your neighborhood? Um, in the case of some of your neighborhoods, you have really deep history. And so researching that history and knowing what it is and deciding how you may want to use it as you talk about your neighborhood uh, is really important. I think, too, that this idea of story goes back to what we talked about in the very first session. And that is that we do everything, all of our programs, at the uh, Institute for Civic Leadership, the Andrews Institute. We base almost all our programs in the work of Marshall Gantz, who was a great community organizer. For those of you who are old enough, he organized with Cesar Chavez the lettuce boycott in pay to help the, um, the plight of migrant farmers in California. And he now is a professor at the Kennedy School. And he has codified his really successful work of the last 30 years in organizing neighborhoods and groups. He's, he's codified it in three questions, very simple questions. Who am I? And that's why we gave you the collaborative leadership assessment in the first session. Who are we? That's why you need to talk with your neighborhood and get the stories and the architecture and the history and the businesses. And, and really find out who you are as a neighborhood. What's the essence of your neighborhood? And then finally, he says, the third question to ask is, what can we do together? And that what can we do together is where you develop your vision and your strategy for getting people to help you create your vision. Now, a key partner in all this is going to be Metro government. And that's why in every one of these sessions, the last half is devoted to getting to know the departments of Metro government better. Um, one thing I will say about Stacy is that she has figured out how to be persistent in getting the interviews that she needs. And so don't take no for an answer. Go to the person's 
place of business. Go, go to uh, the local, okay, you're gonna see that I was born in Arab, Alabama. I'm gonna say the local beauty parlor, the local hair salon, the local barber shop, the local business that's been there forever. And I saw Colby Sledge come in, is he still here? Okay, Colby did a great job when he was the president of Wedgwood Houston of SNAP in connecting the older businesses that were in that area and helping them reconnect with the community. I'm talking about businesses in uh, Wedgwood Houston and helping them connect back to the way that his association wanted to revitalize Westwood Houston. So don't overlook people who, you know, you may say, well, they haven't engaged with the community in years. They just come here and open up their business and then they leave. Don't, don't leave any stone unturned in, in terms of who the resources might be for your stories. Now, why are your stories important? Yes. No, no, please. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Just as you your Sorry, I'm going to stop you because if you say this without speaking into the mic, we won't be able to record it for Metro 3, so. <laughs> All right. Uh, looking at who you talked with, uh, Sulphur, Dale, Gulch, uh, Jefferson Street, did you feel that you left with those communities uh, the intention that, yes, maybe we'll follow up with stories? And my question comes from this standpoint. Jefferson Street as a corridor has enormous, numerous stories. The, it seems to me the people that you highlighted, however, happen to be more the economic portion. But you know, if you just start from Rosa Parks to Tennessee State, you've got so much uh, history that that overnight should seemingly right. revise Jefferson Street. And yet, except for that place, the Capitol area, the Gulch area, it's languishing. Absolutely nothing seems to be happening on Jefferson Street. So what did you take away from that, please? So with that, uh, case study, we we did just look at the economic part of it because it was a case study on urban redevelopment. Um, I will tell you that with my project, DASH, which I didn't tell y'all what that stands for, um, it's Discover Architecture Through Stories and History, as, you, as I guess you can see. Um, uh, Jefferson Street um, and the Capital District was actually my initial neighborhood that I was going to do, um, but um, but I quickly realized through my asset mapping um, that I needed to start where I had more assets in my hand, which, um, so that's when I went back to my hometown because I knew the people to talk to there. Um, I do hope to come back to Nashville and do Jefferson Street next because the stories are so dynamic and need to be told. But with that case study, that was really just a, um, an economic study. Did you have some? still have this old-fashioned day job. Yes, Old Timer's Day, May 2nd. <laughs> Thanks for that question. I should also kind of protect Stacy a little bit here and say they only had six weeks to do this case study. And we originally had um, developing the capital district as a separate case study. And I hope that someday soon that will be done by one of our students. Uh, did, in your case study, did you address the uh, notion of some groups in a community exiting out other people in the community? Because in the Jefferson Street community, I've been active for 10 years, and so has this lady right here. And things have been happening over there. But um, I do feel that I'm, I've been blocked by jump. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, JUMP is Jefferson Street United Merchants Association partnership, yes, yes. Well, and I think this gets to what we've talked about earlier, and that is that we're stronger together. So even though this case study looked at urban redevelopment, Stacy's broader work in Dixon went beyond the business community and looked at all of the assets in a community. Uh, but I, I love these meetings because they do bring to light some areas that you know, there is work to be done. And, uh, and so that's why you're here, so that you can make those bridges. 
I know, I've got to close. Yeah. Real fast. fast. Stacy, I just wonder, I've only been to Dixon a couple of times, but I see where they're redeveloping the downtown. Did, did that redevelopment have anything to do with your study at all? No. <laughs> She can't, she can't take credit for that, wish we could. <laughs> okay, your homework for next time, in addition to the asset mapping, is to do at least one interview, preferably two, from different types of residents. You can be an individual neighbor, it can be somebody who's lived there a long time, it can be a business owner who is bringing economic development to the area. And, I'll throw this in, it can be someone you want to bring to the area. Somebody that you would like to get interested in your neighborhood. That's going to be an assignment out of the next one, but if you want to go ahead and get a jump start, you can. But the most important thing is, tell me some stories from your neighborhood. And Stacy is going to be back to help you work with those stories uh, in putting together a final plan towards your vision. So, I want to ask, I want to ask Dr. Farrell, who promised me he could do this in five minutes, to come and talk about using the educational assets of your neighborhood. And he is from Treveca, and they have been working for 20 years in Chestnut, 11 years in Chestnut Hill. <clears throat> Um, since I'm a professor, I better make my first my two points real quick so that you'll catch them and then you can let yourself be distracted. One has to do with working with the top versus working with the bottom. Go for the bottom, not the top. Quite easy. Go for the people that are right on the street. Don't go for the big agencies, even though this whole meeting is about going for big agencies. <clears throat> Second, every neighborhood on earth has some degree of social injustice and environmental injustice. Social injustice we can't speak to right now, but if you look at environmental injustice carefully, you can change it into environmental capital. It is an invisible asset and it's an important asset. The simplest example I can give you is you have the poorest housing next to the junkyard. You do not build junkyards next to the country club or the golf course. Never happens. If you look at those junkyards, you can start disassembling them and turn them into vital capital. And there are grants for doing that in addition to the actual value of it. <clears throat> There are big businesses, there are universities, and there are metropolitan governments, agencies or county governments that want to expand. 11 years ago, there was a nearby neighborhood that was trying to, uh, that was being, um, one of their parks was being lost due to an expansion. The big guy was trying to move in and expand and the neighborhood was losing a vital resource. I said to myself, that's not what Trevecca is all about. And I went to Ronnie Greer, who was Metro Councilman for District 17. I learned about their meeting. I went there and I said, I promise you this, whatever we do, we want to help stabilize the neighborhood. We want people to be able to stay in their houses. We want them, we want the neighborhoods to develop. And that's about all I could say because you know, I was actually told don't bother to go, uh, but I did. And then when I went to a local neighborhood group meeting, a lady who had Alzheimer's challenged me by saying, did you come from the university just to make a report on us or are you gonna actually stay and work? And uh, I just felt like, no, I am come here to work. And I meant it, and I wanted to know what their interests were. And I discovered these local neighborhood action groups are really a key to being able to do something. So we actually have developed, uh, because we were interested in urban gardening and then changing nasty looking lots into at least good looking lots that are useful for something, um, we've actually established our own urban farm on the campus. And we have about 20 gardens in the Chestnut Hill area. 
And uh, if you come to Chestnut Hill, you'll even see signs of that, the gardens, as well as a big sign on a railroad underpass, which we weren't supposed to put up, but we did anyway, uh, which <laughs> indicate that this is a place that cares about the health of the neighbors, because this is a critical issue, and we want to see this change. So we really look, do look to what is happening um, with the people, what are they really interested? I mean, are they interested in insulation programs, but they can't find a way to get to it? Hey, then somebody can get active. That's wonderful, wonderful. Well, we're so excited for all the stories that you guys have shared. We're going to give you guys about a five-minute break. So please get up, stretch your legs. And then planning is going to talk a little bit about where they're at in the Nashville Next process. So we're excited to have them. So uh, take five. First, I'd like you all to give yourselves a round of applause because you did great work today. Second, the homework is going to be posted. And third, also with the departments in the back will be Lydia Linker, our managing director for the Andrews Institute, with more information about the program that Stacy's in. And there's two reasons you may want to know this. One is some of you may actually want to come join us. We have students who are aged 24 to 61, and it's a weekend program. The second reason is that all of our students do a project in community. They are are charged with creating a sustainable project and community so some of the work you're doing in your neighborhoods may be something that you'd like to reach out to our students on. So please see Lydia in the back for more information. I'll see you back on the 28th when we are going to finish a strategic plan for you and your neighborhood. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, do you guys want to shoot the mic here yeah. or do you want to? Okay. All right, folks, I am going to now introduce Catherine Withers with our Metro Planning Department, and she is going to talk to you guys about an update on the awesome Nashville Next pro process that they have been doing, and the mayor referred to the incredible engagement that they've had on this program. Catherine? Thank you. Good morning. Um, so how many in the audience have heard of Nashville Next? Let's see, that. good, good, that's great. Um, so I'm gonna give a brief overview of where we are on that and then talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day work of the planning department and um, how you can interact with that. So what is Nashville Next? It's been a three-year process um, to update the city's general plan, which is an integrated effort to ensure our prosperity um, over the next 25 years, and we've drawn on the needs, ideas, and input of the people who care about Nashville. Um, so why do we need to have a, a plan? Because we're a growing community. It's expected that we're going to have 200,000 more people in Nashville by 2040. And um, so we're the green line up there. And then our surrounding counties are growing even faster than we are. Um, at the same time, our population diversity is changing. Um, by 2040, the uh, major three races, whites, blacks, and Hispanics, are all going to be around 30%. And then our households are changing. Not only are the number of households growing, but the number of households without children is expected to be around 81% by 2040. So um, households are gonna be looking for different forms of housing when you've only got one or two people in a household than they did when there were four or five people in a household. So throughout this process, we've um, kept our four pillars at the forefront of the conversation. Um, equity and inclusion has been represented by Nashville for all of us. Economic and workforce development has been represented by the Nashville Chamber. Environmental stewardship represented by the Land Trust for Tennessee. And efficient government represented by the Metro government. Uh, throughout this process, there have been different um, research efforts and background reports um, that have gone into to this. And if you haven't been on our website, you should, and um, check all those out. There's a, a broad depth of knowledge out there. And this process has been different from past efforts, um, so a lot of you have heard about that. 
And that's not just because of our staff, it's because of the efforts of our community members to um, get the word out in a way that hasn't been done in previous efforts. Uh, we've held over 200 community briefings and been at 50, over 50 community events. We've had a community engagement committee. I've seen some of our members out there. Um, not only have these leaders helped us get the word out, but they have served as a sounding board about how we should um, interact with the community. So where we are now, we've had a total participation at this point of 17,000. I expect that number will, will go up in the next month. Um, and what we heard from people, this has been um, boiled down into the guiding principles. This, these are the main points important to the people of this city. One, ensuring equity for all, because Nashville is stronger, because we value diversity in all forms and welcome all expand accessibility. Um, Nashville will, in the future, will have a complete, efficient transportation system, including transit, walking, and biking options, in addition to our existing road network. Um, creating economic prosperity for all. Fostering strong neighborhoods, because they are the building blocks of our community. Advanced education, not just K through 12 education, but lifelong learning. Championing the environment. Uh, we're lucky we're in a place of unique natural beauty. We have exceptional parks and greenways. And uh, we protect those going forward because they contribute to our health and quality of life. And then just being Nashville, um, we lift each other up and uh, celebrate our culture of creativity. Um, so this is the preferred future map. This is a tool for aligning spending regulations, zoning regulations, other land development regulations, and other metro programs to shape improvements in the quality of life so that new development and redevelopment aligns. Um, this map shows centers and corridors growing. Um, it doesn't show up so well, but the, the light green, that's our natural area that will be protected and preserved, and also the transportation network that pulls it together. <clears throat> there are seven elements to the plan, and um, these elements have been developed by resource teams that are made up of um, community members and other metro ag agencies with topical expertise on the trends facing us in order to provide um, direction for the future that's balanced with our community vision and values. Uh, when I put together these slides, I thought that we were releasing the draft plan on March 30th, but it's actually the 27th. So that'll be a Friday. It'll be posted on our website. And then the plan is projected right now to be at the Planning Commission on June 11th for public hearing. It's broken up into these five elements. It does include updates to the community plans, as well as our um, transportation vision. That's Access Nashville 2040. Uh, the hot topics, we're expecting um, our um, rural policies. There are some proposals in the plan to limit development, possibly including limiting sewer extensions into those areas that were shown as green on the preferred future. And some folks really want to keep those areas rural, and others are hoping for more development out there. So there will be a strong debate about that. Um, the transit network, of course, we've had a lot of discussion in the past year. Where does it go? What does it look like? Is it on Charlotte, Dickerson, West End, or, or other places? But also development along those corridors um, will need to be dense and include pedestrian amenities to support transit ridership. Uh, centers and investments. If there's an area of town that's projected to grow, then projects to improve infrastructure in those areas need to follow in the city's capital improvement uh, programs. So this is always a hot issue to decide what community is getting spending on infrastructure and what isn't. Uh, transitions in neighborhood character. Um, this is always a topic of discussion at the Planning Commission. And since building permits have picked up um, and we're growing, um, where are these 200,000 people coming going to live? And how do we preserve what we value about our communities but allow for additional housing and um, new types of housing? 
And then affordability, this has been a big topic of discussion lately, not just um, in low income, but also market rate housing. Um, this is often concern, expressed to the Planning Commission in displacing um, affordable housing and long-term residents with new development. But I've also heard concerns from major employer, employers that they're having a hard time hiring people because they don't want to spend a long time commuting because they can't afford to live nearby. So this is going to be an issue that will need to be addressed. So. Um, the plan will be posted on the 27th, but then you can also uh, review it in person. We plan to have an open house similar to our kickoff um, on Saturday, April 18th. That location will be determined, but it'll be a morning to early afternoon. And then there will be four additional meetings um, out in the four corners of the county. Monday, April 20th, we'll be in both sort of the northeast and the southeast. And then on the 27th in Bellevue and Madison, and those are on the back of the flyers that are on your table. And then we'll also be holding additional special meetings to reach those um, harder to reach populations, people who don't speak English. Um, and all this, it will be online <clears throat> through April 30th. So please go on and comment. And then we will provide a static draft addressing those comments um, after that. And, um, will be at the June 11th public hearing. So um, what are we going to do with this plan after it's in place? And how does it relate to other plans you may have been involved in? Well, it will feed into the community plans. These are the 14 different community sub-area plans that you may have been involved in in the past. Um, so uh, we will be updating those as well. And that will feed down into recommendations for zoning, subdivisions, and capital improvements. But then it also influences spending on transportation, bike and pedestrian improvements, open space acquisitions, um, housing policies, and economic development policies. And we'll implement it through private development, uh, through, the, through zoning decisions, public investments for new infrastructure, and then um, community, perhaps you know, tree planting programs, other different community-led initiatives. Um, so you can just see the pictures. Private development will be new, new construction and then public, new roads like the 2831st Avenue connector, our sidewalk program, and then community through tree planting and beautification. So, and then just to talk a little bit about our day-to-day -day work um, with the Planning Commission and um, zoning, zoning decisions and where you can get more information. So the Planning Department is the staff that works for the Planning Department. Um, our responsibilities include working with local communities to create appropriate land use policies and those community plans. And then we make recommendations to the Planning Commission on zoning decisions, subdivisions, and other development applications. And then we also provide uh, design services to support sustainable development. So the Planning Commission is a body that consists of 10 members. Um, there's a seat for the mayor or typically a mayor's designee. And then the chairman of the Planning and Zoning Committee of Council. They're the two charter members. And then the mayor appoints eight other members who serve staggered four-year terms. They generally meet twice a month at 4 p.m. in this room. And what is zoning? It's a set of rules that govern how land may be used and then the um, development standards um, that control building on those properties. The Planning Commission makes recommendations to the Metro Council on all zoning changes but the council has final approval. The community members have input on land use policies through the community planning process. So that's why it's so important that the community is involved because we use those policies to base our recommendations on to the planning commission. Both the planning commission and the council hold public hearings on individual zone changes. So there are at least two opportunities for public input during the zone change process. Uh, then subdivision is the division of land into lots streets and open spaces. And those regulations can vary based on the location of a property, the number of lots being proposed. Um, subdivisions that are on the Planning Commission agenda require notice be sent to the surrounding property owners, and there's one public hearing. 
You can get more information on any of this by calling um, our information desk at 615-862-7190, or there's also a planning staff at Nashville Gov email. And check out our website, there's lots of information on there. And then if you're looking for information on current applications, you should go to our development tracker website. Um, the map will come up, there are dots all over the county and you can click on the part of town you're interested in and it pulls up the applications and additional information. And it'll tell you the staff planner who's reviewing the case, you can contact them. And then if it's just a piece of property you want more information on, the Parcel Viewer website, that's a great place to look. You can find out zoning, the size of property, who owns it. Um, so those are places to get more information. So thank you so much for coming out this morning, and I will be around if anybody has any questions after. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And, and we're going to do the department stuff at the end. So that's, that's what we're doing at the end. John really wants to say something. Yeah, just two things. OK. One, one I believe that the mayor uh, submits recommendations for planning commission members to the Metro Council. Uh, the Metro Council approves those members. Uh, that's true. And the second thing is uh, that this, next, this Nashville Next project is probably the most important thing as a neighborhood you can be involved in. Uh, it will dictate what your community looks like for the next 25 years and what, what gets zoned, what doesn't get zoned, and how things are going to go about. So these last four meetings are really important. <laughs> And I, I just want to point out that John is a, mem a charter member of our Community Engagement Committee, so he's earning his keep right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. No, th this, par this portion is going to be, uh, like I said, codes and planning will be up here at the end um, to ask questions and all that kind of stuff at, um, at the end. So uh, let, but without further ado, and we're actually staying on schedule, Yes, Jimmy. <laughs> I would just like to ask you to join me in thanking Nashville and particularly those people and Dudley, the Lipscomb University, that in my opinion is underrated for everything that they do. <laughs> they do. They're a great partner. That was a great comment, Jimmy. And, and the Lipscomb has been an incredible partner on this, so we really do, we do thank them so much. But let me, without further ado, turn this over to our wonderful Metro Codes Department. Uh, Bill Penn is going to talk to you guys about codes, and then at the end of this, we're gonna talk about the Metro side of the homework, which is, of course, participating in the Nashville Next Plan, and then the Notice Program, which he's just gonna talk to you guys about now. So, Bill? All right, it's always a pleasure to get out, talk to the neighbors. I see some folks out here that I know, uh, and so they know a, a little bit about codes, but then I see some new folks who may not uh, know about the, that wonderful codes department that is out there trying to make sure that uh, the buildings don't fall down on them and some other things that we do. Now, a lot of things that were talked about in the planning presentation really work hand in hand with what we do. but. Kind of give you a brief history. You know, codes has been around a long time. People think, oh, codes are just, that's a recent thing. About 5,000 years ago, really, codes started uh, coming on. People started thinking about regulating things. Uh, so, so it's not new, and neighborhoods aren't new. All of this stuff is going on a long time. We just sort of keep relearning the history. Now, the Babylonians had a code, and they even had a scale. You know, if a guy built a house for somebody, then he got so many shekels for a say, which is about uh, 12 square feet of house. So he didn't just build and get nothing for it. We had a plan. They had a plan even way back then in Babylonian times, okay? And before I go any further, how many folks have ever gotten any kind of correspondence from the codes department? Okay, was it good correspondence? <laughs> Now the ones that the ones that got the other letters, y'all can own up too, right? <laughs> well, but they, you know sometimes it just happens, you know. Uh, anyway, I, I I always find that curious to find out 
what the inner reaction is. Now, this is a really interesting law. This goes back to Babylonian times, about uh, the time of Christ, a little bit after that, where if I'm a builder, I build a house for you, and it falls in on you and kills you, well, guess what? I get killed too. They take me out and... Now imagine, imagine if we had this law today, okay? We'd have some really great buildings being built today, wouldn't we? Houses would just be, everything would be perfect. You wouldn't have to have that punch list when the new house gets built because they're not going to risk this happening. Of course, we don't have that. Uh, you know, we, we kind of have to rely, and that's why we rely on codes to kind of help make sure that we're sort of this, we're sort of the knife, if you will, so to speak, in the building thing. You know, we don't really go out and kill anybody, but we do try to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. So when you get into that new building, or you get into that renovated building, that it's gonna be safe and secure for you, your family, your business, or whatever you're doing. But now, you know, a lot of times, things don't get changed because of meetings like this, where we have Nashville next, where people work on it on the front end, where they consider what's going to happen and what gets, what's needed. Now, we wait till something happens, and then all of a sudden we want to do something. The ancients were this way. Now, you know, they had a collapse of an amphitheater back in 27 AD. 50,000 people were either hurt or killed. And can you imagine that? Now, I was going to say that that'd be like the Titan Stadium falling in during the Titans game, but there probably wouldn't be 50,000 people there. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I, I, I'm, I apologize to the Titans fans. This is going to be the year, right? This is going to be the year. Okay. Rome catches on fire, burns pretty much to the ground, 64 AD. One of the problems was they didn't really have any regulations. Stuff was built any way they wanted to build, out of any material they wanted to build it. They didn't really consider what would happen if somebody's lamp fell over and set that house on fire, whether or not everything else would catch on fire. So those, you know, they didn't think about that. It wasn't important. But now, you know, London, 1189, they said, you know what, we need to have a plan. We need to consider things. Like I said, I got a Brit over there, you know. She, you know, they were kind of ahead of the game and everything. But what happened? What happened? The fire, they had two fires. 1212, they had a fire. And then the Great Fire of London, 1666, 15,000 buildings destroyed. Now, can you imagine that? 15,000 buildings destroyed, one fire. But I'm not going to leave out the folks on the other side of the pond, North America, you know, where we live, our hangout, because, you know, we aren't perfect either. Chicago Fire, 1871, lasted two days. And I, and I try to imagine a fire of that scale lasting two days. 17,000 buildings destroyed, 100,000 people left homeless. California earthquake. All of us in this room were around when that happened. And they said, you know what, we're going to have to get serious serious about our building codes. We're going to have to realize that we're on a fault line and we're going to have to make sure our buildings don't fall down when the ground moves. Second quake in 94, extensive damage. Even after considering modifying buildings and all of that, they still had significant damage. 2003, and this is a really strange one. All of a sudden, multi-story decks started falling off buildings. Okay, uh, and the reason was there was a code that dealt with that, but guess what? They didn't follow the code, and unfortunately, those individuals that should have been inspecting that didn't inspect it. And of course, a lot of times, people will just build a deck after the fact. And we have a lot of this after the fact building. So if you see some building going on, you can check online to see if they have a permit for that, and if they don't, please let us know. Because it's kind of rough if you're on the second story of a deck and you're having a cold one and all of a sudden it comes off the building. Well, two stories up is a long way to fall down. And usually what, you know what happens? Gravity is a funny thing. You would think the heaviest thing is going to hit the ground first, but that's not the case. Your body will hit the ground first and then the deck is going to fall down on top of you. That's the way it always works, okay? But that's why we have codes. So now, where does codes fit in? 
we're going beyond trying to build safe buildings, although that's very important. We want the buildings to be safe. We want them to be comfortable. We want them to be able to accommodate the uses that they are designed for. But we also want to consider quality of life. How is that building going to impact the neighborhood where it's being built? You know, is it going to fit in? And that's why we work with the Planning Commission, you know, with looking at plans and making sure that things all make sense. Because sometimes building a building in a certain spot for a certain use doesn't make sense. And a lot of times it doesn't even meet the code and regulations. So that's why we come in to make sure that all of those things are taken care of. And citizens have a really important role in this, even in the codes department, because, you know, you all are our eyes and ears. Um, now, I manage the property standards division that deals with existing structures and making sure that everything that's built is maintained. But I only have 17 folks. Now, Davidson County is a lot of folks. I think I heard there's going to be another 200,000 folks coming in here by 2040. Well, they're going to live somewhere. They're going to have vehicles. And guess what else they're going to have? Junk, trash, and debris. Okay? And so we have to manage all of that. And you all play a very important role in helping us do that because you see what's going on in your neighborhoods and you alert us. A lot of folks have alerted us to things that are going on in a neighborhood that we would have never been aware of. Buildings being built without permits uses for buildings that were not consistent with the zoning regulation, in addition to uh, unsafe, unsanitary conditions. So you all play a very active role uh, in your communities in helping us to do what we do. And neighborhood issues are really important to us, and they are growing in importance because uh, a neighborhood is really the lifeblood of a community, and it is the lifeblood of a city. If you want to see a city that's on a decline, all you have to do is look no further than the neighborhoods within that city. If the neighborhoods aren't active, vibrant, involved, and engaged, then you're going to have blight, and it's just not going to work. So very, very important. The Coast Department, we have five principal divisions, and I'm going to talk briefly about each one of those. That's how we're organized. I, had a big organizational chart, but most folks, when they looked at that, they go, well, I, you know, what does that mean? So I'm going to simplify this a little bit. Now, the administration section, they're sort of the puppet masters that pull the strings for all the folks within the codes department to kind of get us doing what we're supposed to be doing, making sure and managing the codes process in total. Contractor licensing is a very important thing. If you ever had anything built, would anybody in this room hire a contractor without knowing whether or not that individual is licensed to do the work? Anybody would, would anybody do that knowingly? We get calls, I get a call personally, probably two or three or four a month where someone has engaged a contractor who has built something for them or renovated something for them and that person did not have a license to do the work. The work turned out to be shoddy not in accordance with the code, and they wanted to know what I was going to do about that. Well, unfortunately, I can't do anything about that. It is buyer beware, so to speak. So contractor licensing is very, very important. We take that very seriously because the, that's the beginning of the end or the, the beginning of disaster if you have something built by somebody who is not certified to do that work. And we have a lot of folks that come in and they want, to, they want to hire a home improvement contractor to do general contracting work. Well, there's a reason there's a division between what a general contractor can do and what a home improvement contractor can do. Because the general contractor is going to be able to do jobs that require much more expertise and that are more complicated. And he also has the ability to absorb more liability in case that project goes south through no fault of the property owner. Home improvement contractors can't do that. They can do the small jobs, but if you've got a big, if you've got a job that's gonna cost more than $25,000 to do, then you need to have a general contractor doing that work. Just something to throw out there. Now, we also have a number of boards in the codes department that will hear um, things from individuals who want exceptions to the code. 
uh, and it deals with a building code. We have a building board, fire uh, board, plumbing, where they want to do something that's not quite in line with the code based on what they want to do. So those boards will hear those appeals to decide whether or not we can accommodate that, that their, their um, desire to go outside of the code. And they also review the law, the state law requires that we update our codes on a regular basis. So that's what the administrative section does. They look at our codes and make recommendations on updating those codes. In fact, they're working on that now. We're looking at probably adopting the 2012 international building code, international codes, not just the building code. And those recommendations will be made, made to members, made to the Metro Council. If the council approves those, then our building, all of our codes will be updated to the 2012 version. So that's, that's what they do. Now the plans division, you've heard a little bit about plans and, and, and sort of kind of like planning, but the plans folks examine the actual blueprints for the buildings that are going to be built. Now a lot of people think, man, you know, I mean, you know, we've got a blueprint, you know, I mean, how hard could it be to, to follow the blueprint, right? Well, how many, now, now I know the women in here, this question does not apply to you. Okay, this is a man question. Okay, how many men have put something together? And had parts left over at the, at the when you when you were done. <laughs> Just all of you raise your hand because it's you all have. Okay. Now imagine having a few screws left over when you put the grill together, right, or the bookcase or whatever. Multiply that by a hotel. Imagine imagine the convention center if your average guy had built that. Okay. <laughs> There wouldn't be a there wouldn't be a guitar on the roof. It'd be a cello or a violin or something, you know. Because well, well, but it's close. It's a musical instrument, okay. I mean, it's okay. It's not a guitar, okay, you know. So that's why we have plans review to make sure. Uh, consider this building where we're in now. Now we take it for granted that when we pull on the door handle, it's going to open and we can come in. And in an emergency, when we push on it, we can go out. We assume that. Well, there was a building, I'm not gonna say where the building was, or is, because it's existing now, fairly new, was built, beautiful building. Well, they had the exit door handles reversed. So you could get in, but you couldn't get out. <laughs> and it was one of those things where, I mean, it was right on the plan. The right hardware was purchased thing is, when it was installed, it was installed backwards. Well, you can't tell that by just looking at it. So a group of folks come over to look at this fine building and they say, oh, this is wonderful, beautiful. But oh, you know, we got another meeting, so we need to go. Well, they go out right that, that exit right over there, just go out that door there. Well, they're going and they're like, we can't get out of this. How do we get it? Oops. Small problem to fix, but could have been a big problem had there been an event and you got a bunch of folks trying to get out and the door doesn't open. So plans review is very important. And we've gotten very, we've gotten much, much better with plans review now. Uh, we still have people that take actual paper plans and look at them and review them. But now we have what's called electronic plans review where you submit your architectural drawings via computer file and then everybody involved can look at that and, they, and make annotations on corrections that need to be made and so all you have to do then is just press a button and get the updated plan produced without having to have somebody go back and redraw everything. Uh, all the notes can be made. So you have a record of all the notes and everything and who made those notes, when they made them. They can do and get into much more detail like with this electronic process than they could ever with the paper process. But we still do have people who come in with a napkin and a plan drawn on it. And we still look at that, we still review that. And sometimes we can make it work because we're the codes department and you know we're, we're the other public safety department and we can make it work. Okay, so bring it in on a napkin, bring it in normal architectural drawings or send it to us electronically, we can handle that. Now the zoning department, you've heard a little, uh, quite a bit about the zoning actually sort of uh, with the planning's presentation where we talk about land use. Now, in a, where they talk, make recommendations and, and what have you on land use, we actually apply that. We're the ones that, when somebody's gonna build a commercial building, 
we make sure that one, it's that parcel is zoned for that type of activity. And then later on, we may have to go out and make sure that that activity is still going on in accordance with the zoning that is for that particular parcel. And that's, in fact, that's what my guys, my property standards guys do. We're the actual ones who go out. If somebody calls us and says, hey, Bobby's operating a lawnmower business out of his garage. Now, I know that's probably not happening in any of your neighborhoods, but occasionally it happens. Well, we're the ones who go out and see whether or not Johnny's operating a, uh, a repair shop out of his garage. And people do it. People, you know, you get a guy, he's a mechanic, and I know him. My car is acting up. I drive it over there. Well, I'll take a look at it. Well, next thing you know, if we don't get on top of that, Everybody in the neighborhood is bringing their car over to Joe's because, well, Joe's a mechanic and he's cheap. Well, all you got to do is buy the parts, he'll put them on. Well, it goes, it goes from brakes. Next thing you know, he's pulling a transmission out, pulling an engine out. Well, you can't do that in a residential zone. And you all are probably familiar with some of these zoning categories. I threw a few of them up here. R and R, R is for residential, and RS are residential single family, meaning that. That's a single family dwelling, can't be, you can't split it up into a duplex, triplex, quad. And understand that a lot of times, again, that's what we depend on you all, because sometimes people will buy a big house. And we heard something about Lipscomb, you know, we have some great universities here in Nashville, Lipscomb, Vanderbilt, Belmont. Well, they have really great houses around them. And people figured out a little while back that I'll buy one of these big houses and I'll get me a dozen Vanderbilt students in there. Well, now, I'm a University of Tennessee graduate, not Rocky Top, but in Chattanooga, okay. But I, but I don't say that part of it because I want to kind of get the, the amenity of, you know, a big orange kind of thing. But people know that a Vanderbilt student generally is well-heeled enough to where they can afford a decent rent. So I'm going to get six or seven of them in there, charge them $1,200 a month each rent, and I'll make a fortune. And they are making a fortune. Well, guess what? You can't have more than three unrelated people in a house. I don't care how big it is, okay? But they're doing it, or have done it. We catch them all the time. That all relates back to zoning and land use. You can't, you know, you have to understand how you can use a property and must use it appropriately. People want to operate a business in the house. Well, you can actually get a home occupation permit to operate a home-based business. But there's some restrictions on that, okay? And if you notice a business operating out of a house in your community and you have a question as to whether it's legitimate, please bring that to our attention. I can't stress enough to to all of you that, you know, because a lot of times people say, well, I don't want to call codes, you know, well, I know, I, you know, they're, 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 call me. If you're not bothering us. We, we really want to know what's going on because we have no way of dealing with it a lot of times. Unfortunately, our system is such that we don't have the ability to just start in one end of the county and go all the way to the other end of the county and fix all the problems that may exist. Most of what, 99% of what we do is complaint driven. That's how we deal with it. So you're not complaining really. I hate the word complaint driven. It's a request. Request for service. I like that. It's politically correct. Sounds better. But do call us. Now, a lot of times property owners will want to do something, but they maybe not understand what it is that they can do based on their zoning. We encourage folks before they, especially in a commercial situation, before a lease is signed, modifications made to the building for your business, and please spread this word out to your neighbors. Come to the codes department, talk to the zoning folks, because I don't know how many times somebody has spent five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to modify a building, they've signed a year lease, and they find out they can't sell tires at that location. Or they can't repair cars at that location, or they can't sell cars at that location. And they want to know, they ask me, Well, Bill, you've got to help me. And I said, Well, I can't help you. Okay. I can't, well, I went, to the, I went to the clerk's office, I got my business license. Why didn't they tell me? Well, that's not their, 
mission to tell you. That's your, you're supposed to do that kind of the research in what you're doing. Their mission is to make sure that you have a license to operate your business. Their mission is not to make sure that the spot where you're going to operate that business is legal. So that's something, if I, that's another thing, if it can get out there, because it really is a problem. The permit section, once you've gone through, you know the zoning is right, you've had your plans reviewed, now it's time to get the appropriate permits to build the building or to do the renovation, whatever the case may be. And that's the critical piece because that makes sure if you don't get a permit and you just go out and build something, well, then there's no way for us to, one, know that you're doing it. And also, there's no way for us to go out and inspect to make sure that what's being done is according to the code. And the worst thing that can happen is you get two-thirds of the way through with your building project where pipes are covered up, wiring is covered up, and we find a problem. We, we come out, somebody tells us about it, we come out and look and go, oh, lo and behold, the wiring is wrong or the plumbing is wrong or the mechanical system's been put in wrong. Then you have to take all of that stuff out and you're going to spend a lot more money than you would have had you got the permit and had they had their inspections. So very critical thing that we do with the permits to make sure that everything goes according to your plan. And also it makes sure that everything is consistent with the permit because a lot of folks will get a permit to do one thing and I know this is going to be shocking, but they'll go off. Well, I'm going to get a permit to build this, but I'm really going to be doing that, you know. And, and of course, the building is the inspectors, they come out, they inspect the construction. They don't inspect the use. So they inspect the construction. Everything looks good. They get, they, so they, then they get ready to get that final UNO so they can occupy their building. And then that's when we find out that's not going to be a pizza place. That's going to be a nightclub. Well, there's a whole different set of regulations that cover that. You mean I can't get my UNO? I've got my liquor and beer being delivered here. We're having a big party this evening. I mean, I've got a no, sorry. Can't do it. So very critical uh, piece here that they play. Now, and permits are required for anything over 100 square feet. If it's 100 square feet or larger, you need to get a permit. That includes if you, how many folks own a shed that you, you know, those prefab sheds you buy from Home Depot, Lowe's, that kind of thing? If it's bigger than 10 by 10, I hope you had a permit for that. <laughs> if you didn't, don't tell me. <laughs> okay, because I, it's Saturday and I don't want to have to write you up. Okay, but yeah, you spoke, and the reason for that is just to make sure a prefab structure is not quite as critical as one that you build from the ground up. But it makes sure that, that whatever it is, is safe. Because a 10 by 10 structure, if it falls down on you, you're gonna put a, it's going to put a hurting on you. Okay, and if it's two by two or something like that, a small thing, it falls over, yeah, you probably live to tell the tale. But bigger things, so we want to make sure it's right. And the other thing about having a permit is, if you have a permit, then somebody comes out and looks at it. Now, Home Depot and Lowe's will put your shed wherever you want it to be. Now, I have a shed that came with the house we just bought, and it's in a spot that my wife approves of, which is the rear part of the yard, far away from her view. Well, you've got to be careful because there's a little thing called setbacks around your property. If you set that shed in the setback, guess what? Now, Home Depot and Lowe's, they're not going to, when they deliver it, they're not going to say, uh, ma'am, where's your setback? Now, you, you wanted this way back here, but now are we putting this in your setback? No, they're not going to say that. They're going to put it wherever you say. Because they're going to be waiting on the phone when you call and say, you know what, you got to move that shed because it's in my setback. Well, I'll be right out there, and that's 100 bucks or 200 bucks. <laughs> so permits are very important because that makes sure that you have really the authority to do what it is you're going to do. Permits generally last, they have a life expectancy of about two years. Now most projects don't take that long to build, but sometimes they do. Uh, sometimes a, a, a owner who's building his own house, and, and as an owner you can build your own house. I don't recommend it. Yes ma'am. Uh, well I, tell you what, I think we're going to have questions at the end, so if you would hold that question. 
Oh, a set setback is a distance from your property line into which you cannot build anything. And there's a front, side, and a rear setback. So basically, where your house sits, when you walk out the front door, you essentially, there's a setback from where you walk out the front door to the end of the street. You can't put any other building in that area. Same for the side and the rear. And it's a little, di each, each area is a little different. Some are five feet on the side, some are 10 feet on the side, just depends. Uh, but that's something to know if you wanna build something within, on your property. Now, fence can be built on the property line. Don't recommend that unless you got really great neighbors but it can be built on the property line. What happens if the fence is on the other side of the property line, for example? Well, <laughs> I think they want us to get with, get those questions at the end. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you, will, if you will hold that hold that thought, I will be happy to answer that. And I do have an answer for that. Uh, now, demolition permits are good for 90 days. A lot of people will get a demo permit thinking, oh, well, I'll get to it you know, when I get to it. Well, those have a very short life expectancy. So if you get one and you don't tear it down within 90 days of getting it, you have to get another one. Um, now, we don't have to have a permit for routine work. If you're just going to take out an old bathroom vanity, put another one in, don't need a permit for that. And if you're going to build a pole barn and your property is zoned agricultural, you don't have to have a permit for that. Agricultural property, if you're building some a accessory structure on it, you don't have to have a permit. And the building division. These are the guys that go out and make sure that whatever gets built is going to conform to the architectural plan and it's going to meet all the code requirements for that particular structure. We are right now based on the 2006 code, but that's probably going to change within the next 12 months. We're going to go up to the 2012 code. And of course, I said the first steps of plan review. Once the plan is reviewed, you get your permit. The next step would be as the construction begins, there are inspections that have to be called. When you build a building, you're going to dig for your footing. That's an inspection. Then when the footing gets poured and is in place, that's an inspection. Mm -hmm. Then the framing starts going up. That's an inspection. Then you start putting the plumbing in. That's an inspection. The electrical rough in, they call it. That's an inspection. All of these things have to be inspected and you have to be issued a final inspection. Otherwise, when you get to the end, you will not get a use and occupancy permit unless all of those things are documented as being inspected and final. Now, if a building project gets going without a permit and we find out about it, we will stop the work on that particular project. If we see that the project has a permit, but the work is not going according to the code to the point where it is violating the code, we will stop that building project in order to make sure that the corrections be made. Uh, giving an example, we had a, uh, some condominiums being built. Well, they have what they call, they, everybody wants a fireplace, and they, but they don't want the traditional fireplace that's going to take up a lot of room in the house. So they, what they do is they cantilever the fireplace opening out on the out exterior wall, okay? Well, as you know, in Nashville, we're starting to build stuff a lot closer than we used to. Well, what happened was there was a modification on the plan and the, the builder didn't catch the modification and he built it using a normal, he was doing it normally. Well, that cantilever extended a few inches into the side setback. Well, fortunately for him, it was caught before it got too far to where they could just reframe it. But if it doesn't get caught, one or two things happens. Either you tear it all out and redo it, or you get a variance to see if you can actually be allowed to, to let that one go. But again, that's why this whole thing, it's, it is a process that you really that needs to be followed in order to make sure those kinds of things don't happen. Uh, because a lot of times when that happens, the first thing they want to do, well, doggone it, Coe's looked at my plans, why didn't they catch that? Well, your plan's fine. You just built it wrong. <laughs> we can't help it if you build it wrong. But we get blamed for a lot of stuff, anyway. Property standards, now this is, 
this is close to my heart. This is it right here. Now, there are a lot of things in codes that are very important, but they pale in comparison to this right here, okay? Okay? Because anybody can build anything, all right? You can build it. It's easy to build it, but maintain it. And a lot of you are sitting here thinking, well, now, if, if, if somebody spends $500,000 to build a house, there aren't going to be any codes violations on a property like that. I mean, when you're talking codes violations, you must be talking about the hood. You're not talking about Bellevue, Bell Mead, you know. You're not talking about a, Old Hickory or any of those places. You're talking about the inner city. That's where all your trash and debris is. Au contraire, mon ami. Oh, no, no, no. You can find, I can take you and show you a codes violation anywhere, okay? Million dollar property, codes violations, property standards violations. In fact, now nah, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to bring him up because uh, he's been really good here lately, but we had a, we had a musician who uh, was, he violated the code with his building and some things he was doing. You all may know his name, but you know, anyway. So that's just, a, that's just to go to show. It's not just the common guy, the everyday guy that's violating the code. You know, folks that have money and sense and, and everything else are, are violating it along with them. But we, property standards, we want to make sure that the neighborhood is maintained in a safe and sanitary manner. We basically want to make sure the building is maintained. Because if it's not maintained, it's going to become dangerous and it could become unsanitary and unsafe for the occupants of the building. So that's what, that's what we do. That's our goal is to ensure that it's safe for you. And it's safe for anybody that's going to occupy the building. I don't know how many times we get a call from folks who, who are renters who are renting what I consider a dump. Now, my first question is, if it was a dump when you walked in, why do you think it's going to all of a sudden not become a dump? But anyway, they rent it. It's a dump. The landlord won't fix anything. Landlord told them, I'm going to fix all this stuff. You just come on, move in. In fact, I'm going to give you the pain or whatever, and you fix it and all that. Well, nothing ever happens, and here we go. So they call me up, and then I get involved. Well... We can avoid all that by making sure that you don't move into a dump. So if you've got friends, neighbors who are going to rent, tell them, hey, if there's a problem with it, they fix it before you move in. Don't take any kind of assurance that it's going to be fixed afterwards. And that's what we deal with. We deal with the conditions of properties. Now, these are kind of some of the things. You know, we, we're complaint driven. People call us, and we come in and do it. We come in and check it out. Now, we have two neighborhood support programs, the notice program, and then we have neighborhood audits. Some of you here have been involved in the notice program. Basically, what that is is a neighborhood support program where we train neighborhood volunteers to go out and identify basic codes violations. And then they, we have a special form they use to report those violations to us. That basically becomes the first debate letter that goes out as opposed to our inspectors doing that. So it's a really good program. It shortens the time period it takes to notify a property owner of a violation, hopefully to get them to correct it. And of course, neighborhood audits, we have, we do neighborhood audits uh, where we go out and look at geographic areas in a neighborhood. Usually no more than 500. We try to do no more than 500 parcels at a time. Uh, I have a flex team now with four folks on it that I can, that I can dedicate to that. Uh, that fluctuates depending on the department. But our goal is to clean up the exterior of residential and commercial lots. That's our goal, to so clean them up and make sure they stay clean and maintained. And we want to instill a sense of pride in your neighborhood. It's, uh, we want neighbors to feel good about coming out in their yard, enjoying their yard, enjoying their property, uh, or enjoying the business that they're going to. You know, now, my wife is very particular. She will, if, if, if she has to step over trash to get to a business, then she's not going to that business. She won't even go into the parking lot. If there's trash in the parking lot, she's not going to go. Well, I don't think she's the only one. So it's important, really, to get not just residential property owners, but commercial property owners to understand the appearance of your property really is very important, because the better it looks, the more enticing it is. I mean, people are going to want to come and check it out and see what you've got. We want to make sure that everybody's involved. I want you all to be involved. I want you to encourage your neighbors to be involved. Uh, the codes department, we're not the big, bad, mean codes department. We're the kinder, gentler codes department. 
Tell your neighbors if they ever get a letter from us that says notice of violation on it, not to panic, but to pick up the phone and call the inspector that his name is usually at the bottom of the letter. Give him a call or her a call and we will work with you. Now I mentioned neighborhood audits. I talked about how, how many parcels. We, that's not something that we can do a lot of, but I try to fit them in. Neighborhoods request those and I try to fit those in uh, when I can. Because on top of that, you know, we have to respond not only to your request, but requests from the mayor's office of neighborhoods. Shout out to Aaron and the girls there. You know, they, they send us stuff. And we have to respond to uh, members of council. They want certain things done within their districts and what have you. Uh, we even get requests from members of the legislature. You know, they, they call us up. Some of them came from uh, our area, and so they want certain things done, and they are their constituents will call, and that will result in requests. So we have to we have to kind of monitor that and manage that, but it is a tool that we can use. So again, I want to leave you with the fact that we are the other public uh, service agency. Uh, we're like we're sort of we're not the police. I didn't bore my gun today. I don't have a bag. Oh, I do have a. ID card, but I don't have a badge. Uh, they wouldn't give me a badge, and they said I could not have a gun, okay, even though I am qualified to use a, a gun. Well, actually, I'm an artilleryman. I don't know. Some of you may know I was in the Army. I don't, I don't believe in seeing the whites of their eyes. I like to pull this string, and it goes way out there and all that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not American sniper kind of guy. No, no, no. No, no, no. I'm, you know, I'm a missile guy, okay? You know, you press the button, psh, you know. <laughs> But I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think they're going to open it up for questions here later, and we'll, we will be here. I'm going to be here, so be happy to entertain that. Thank you. All right, guys, just so we, for the, for the um, interest of time, we're going to conclude. But I just wanted to say, how many of you guys remember the homework? I know the last session was actually snowed in a little bit, but the homework was to reach out to the Metro Transit Authority, which is back in the back, and check out their, hi Eric, <laughs> uh, and check out their in motion program, which is their five year strategic plan for transit, which is also a really important thing to get involved in. So if you didn't have a chance to do that before, please go back and check out Eric's flyers back there and please get involved. And then the homework this time when you guys go back please check out the notice program and please participate in the Nashville next process we really think it's important to have more voices involved in that conversation and again the planning department and codes department will be up here to answer any of your questions all the rest of the departments are in the back and then we have NASA that's actually outside we had to we had to be creative with the tables but just give everybody a round of applause this was great today great energy thank you and uh, thank you again to Lipscomb and the Andrews Institute for being an incredible partner on this. And we hope to see you March 28th, 9 a.m. at the East Park Community Center. All right? Thanks, guys.